Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Um, I hope and pray that things are going good your way. We keep hearing various different stories of individuals getting their startup of their paperwork and getting ready to come back. And please know that we are just praying and praying and more praying for you that things will go smoothly, that you'll get here quickly, and we'll see your smiling, happy faces soon. We have uh, Mark giving our our, our presentation today from God's Word. We have Wendy singing. Um, always a great day. Always a good day to worship and look into God's Word. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we put the day before you. We thank you, Lord, for your continuous, continuous, uh, over overwhelming presence of love and your strength and your encouragement. Please be with our seafarer friends near and far. Please, uh, as, as people are starting with their paperwork and uh, uh, stories of ships returning back. Lord, may the excitement build and may it just continue until the day we see everybody. We thank you, Lord, for all you do in each and every one of our lives. Lord, fill them with your presence, your hope, and your joy. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Wendy. Hey, sing with me, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. I really wanted to sing along with you, Wendy. It's such a nice song. I really love that. Uh, and, you know, that's a, such an appropriate song for where we're going today uh, in God's Word. Uh, we've been camping out in the book of Exodus for a while, and the uh, children of Israel have been camping out and around Mount Sinai. They're getting downloads, okay? So God's been giving His Word to them. Uh, we have the Mosaic Covenant has already been given, and which is the Ten Commandments, and now it, they're learning what does it mean in everyday life? How do we practice these things that God expects from us? And so uh, as we've gone through, we've seen very practical things, and there's some supernatural things. And then today we're going to look at how God makes some promises to them that are very conditional promises. And before we jump into those conditional promises, does anybody know what the difference between the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant is. Well, let me just tell you. I don't hear anybody out there. No. <laughs> um, but 
the difference is, is that the Mosaic Covenant was based on performance and the uh, New Covenant is based on grace. Not that we can't mess up because obviously we can, but the, uh, the New Covenant is one where uh, we will still have consequences for our sin, but God's grace just gets being renewed day after day after day. And in human nature, we want to prove ourselves. We want to earn our way. And God's like, guess what? I have already done this. I have already accomplished all that's needed for your salvation, for your redemption. Okay, justification, sanctification, all those big words, meaning that in God's eyes, we are made right when we trust in Jesus and what he's done. What an awesome thing. Listen to this verse from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So how do we get united with Christ? Okay, that's a question I'm going to ask and we'll deal with in a few minutes. We're going to jump back over to Exodus chapter 23, and we're going to pick up in verse 20. And I'll tell you what, as Moses got to know more and more about who God was, remember Moses met God first in a burning bush. Moses uh, was meeting with God. He received the Ten Commandments. Moses was somebody who was probably closer to God than any previous person. I would venture to say even closer than Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, just because of the, the in-depth time that Moses would spend with God. Those other uh, men certainly knew God in a personal way, but Moses, I don't know. He, if you look at what all the Bible has to say about Moses, it just seems like Moses was incredibly close to God, even though he wasn't perfect by any of the stretch of the imagination, and he was even disqualified from taking the people into the promised land. He still had an incredible relationship with God that, quote, showed on his face. And we'll get to that later, but uh, at some point, Moses literally glowed. We haven't covered that yet, have we? Yeah. When Moses would be in God's presence, he would come back with what's called nimbus glory, where he he would actually shine or, or reflect God's glory. And and I'll tell you what, that doesn't, I don't know if that's happened uh, to very many people. But um, let's turn if, again to Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. And I'm going to read down to verse 33. And it says this, See, I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. Pay close attention to him and obey his instructions. Do not rebel against him, for he is my representative, and he will not forgive your rebellion. If you are careful to obey him, following all my instructions, then I will be an enemy to your enemies." And I will oppose those who oppose you, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, so that you may live there, and I will destroy them completely. You must not worship the gods of those nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars." You must serve only the Lord your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water, and I will protect you from illness. There will be no miscarriages or infertility in your land, and I will give you long, full lives. I will send my terror ahead of you and create panic among all the people whose lands you invade. I will make all your enemies turn and run. I will send terror ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply and threaten you. I will drive them out in a little 
out a little at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land. And I will fix your boundaries from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the eastern wilderness to the Euphrates River. I will hand over to you the people now living in the land and you will drive them out ahead of you. Make no treaties with them or their gods. They must not live in your land and they will cause you to sin against me. If you serve their gods, you will be caught in the trap of idolatry. All right, so that's the reading of God's word for us today. And I want to just give you a heads up. This is pretty awesome stuff. So we start out, and I read from the New Living Translation. And in the New Living Translation, the word angel there in verse 20 is lowercase. But in many other um, versions of the Bible, it's an uppercase A. Why is that? This is considered by most uh, scholars to be what's called a Christophany or a, uh, a time before Jesus was born of Mary that Jesus appeared on the earth. And there's several that happen, uh, but this is one of them where Jesus makes an appearance and it, probably before Joshua enters the uh the Holy Land, or yeah, but when he goes towards Jericho, he has another meeting with Jesus there. So uh, let's think about why would this be considered a Christophany or an appearance of Christ? And it says here that this angel is going to protect them on their journey and lead you safe to the place I have prepared for you. Uh, let's just pause there for a second. And think about who said, I have to go and prepare a place for you. Well, it was Jesus in John 14, when he's downloading to the disciples what's going to happen. And he says, look, I'm going to go prayer, pre prepare a place for you, which is actually heaven. And I will then, you know, come back. Well, uh, I just think that's so amazing how it uses those words. And, uh, and, and so... Pay close, but here it's talking about how the place that's prepared for them is the promised land. All right. Pay close attention to him and obey his instructions. Do not rebel against him, for he is my representative, and he will not forgive your rebellion. So who but God has the power to forgive sin? Well, only God. And so that means that this has to be some uh, some form of God, some uh, sometime where God appeared before men, and this they called it an angel, I think, because they didn't know what else to call him. And so it says, if you are careful to obey him, following all my instructions, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. I will oppose those who oppose you for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of all those people, right? So let's think about this. If God says that if they will obey him, and then God will do this for them, how crazy are they that they wouldn't just go, okay, how do I do that? I want to make sure that God works on our behalf because that's a lot of people groups that you just named. And I want God to do the fighting. I don't want to have to do the fighting. Well, that's that conditional thing that I was talking about earlier where it says, if you'll obey, then I will. Later, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. See, there's a, a big difference. Jesus doesn't say, I'll bless you if you obey me. God's blessings come when we obey, right? Because we're, we're doing things God's way, and that's the best way. But in this covenant relationship, it was all about their obedience bringing about the blessings. And think about these blessings, okay? It wasn't just that the angel was going to go and drive out all these people, but uh it says, I will completely destroy them. You must not worship their gods, right? So that's another part of it. Just constant um, warning about idolatry and doing anything apart from worshiping God. And then it says, 
um, and they were to utterly destroy every, anything having to do with idolatry, and then they had to only serve God. And then look here in, in the second half of verse 25. I will bless you with food and water. I will protect you from illness. There will be no miscarriage or infertility in your land, and I will give you long, full lives. Man, does it get any better than that? I, I, as we live in the age of a pandemic where everybody is afraid to get sick, God said here that he was going to protect them from disease, that he was going to uh, cause them to be fertile, that they wouldn't have to worry about miscarriages. And I know that, Jeannie, I never had that happen with us, but I know that's such a heartache. And so I always feel for people when they, when they have the hope of a, a child taken away from them. Uh, and, and yet they didn't have to worry about that if they would obey God, if they would uh, serve him only. And then it goes on to say, I will send my terror ahead of you and create panic among all the people in the lands you invade. So let's turn real quick over to Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Sorry. And the, the context is that the spies are going to check things out in the city of Jericho, and this is the response they get. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Um and that was Rahab, who basically tells them that uh, that they all the people had heard about what God had done to the Egyptians, and they were afraid. You know, when God wants to afflict enemies, He can put terror in their hearts. If you read on in the Old Testament, there are many examples. Uh, whether it's when the Israelites were fighting against Philistines or Ammonites or Arameans, there were times when they were facing uh, hordes of people, uh, of the enemy being so much greater than they could have imagined. And the reason why the Israelites were able to defeat them is because God brought fear on them and they would sometimes even fight each other before the Israelites got there. Uh, and I especially love the story of Jonathan when uh, they were outnumbered thousands upon thousands to 600. There was only 600 of them. And Jonathan says to the armor bearer, hey, let's go up and, and see if they'll fight us. If they invite us to go up, uh, then we'll go up and fight them. If they say, we're coming down to get you, then we'll, we'll know that the Lord's not in it. And sure enough, as soon as they started the battle, the whole Philistine army started battling each other and then it was a rout, uh, 600 defeated thousands and thousands. And so anyway, if you want to read that, that's in 1 Samuel. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, story to read. But the fear of God came upon them. Also, it says here um, that God will make all your enemies turn and run. I will send terror. Now, if you look down at the footnotes, there's another thing that it refers to, and that's hornets. And uh, hornets, I don't like bugs like that, especially because I'm allergic to them, but <laughs> but that comes true in Joshua chapter 24. I think it's in verse 12. Yeah, so in Joshua 24, 12, I sent terror or hornets ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. And it was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. So that's when God brought all of this to pass, that, that God took care of it through supernaturally by sending hornets. Um, and then he says, I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply and threaten you. I will drive them out a little at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land, and I will fix your boundaries from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. 
and then it basically God is saying this this is a big land that I'm giving you I know you want it to all be where you could go and put borders around the whole thing and be done with the conquest but it's gonna take time and you're gonna have to trust me to keep working even even though it's taking longer than you expect sometimes in the Christian walk in the Christian faith we we just want to be like Jesus right away right we want to have certain things out of our life we want certain enemies uh, to be subdued and yet God doesn't do it right away you know it took uh, Joshua seven years to finish the conquest of the promised land but even then they didn't achieve the boundaries that God was giving them in this passage it took until actually David and Solomon until the country or the nation of Israel got anywhere close to those boundaries and uh, when Solomon was king that was at the zenith or the the height of their their empire so listen to what I'm saying you may be struggling with things in your life that keep seeming to defeat you God doesn't mean that God's not real it doesn't mean that your faith isn't real it just means that uh, for whatever reason right God is allowing you to struggle a little longer trust him he knows you he knows you inside and out and he's not giving up on you ask him to continue to, to hone your faith and to give you victory in the area maybe you've been depending on your own strength this whole time and you need his strength to overcome it commit to him daily seek his forgiveness when you mess up and know that God is in control that God is the one who will gain the glory and that sometimes God is allowing us to be humbled so that we don't think what's wrong with that person why are they still struggling there and just write them off God wants us to have compassion and love one for another that's the thing that keeps getting brought back to my attention uh, so often these days is that we're to grow in our our knowledge of the Lord we're to grow spiritually and we're to grow in our love one for another and so God's keeping us at a point where we can do that and so I, I hope that through all of this time of uncertainty all of this time of uh, so much fear that you're understanding that God doesn't change that God is in control and that God loves us and it's not dependent on our circumstances it's not dependent on our bank account it's not dependent on our health God's love is forever and God's love is for certain and when we come to know that is when we reach a certain level of maturity and God can then use us to help others so I, I hope that through this through these waves of hope chapel service that you're finding hope in Jesus Christ because that is our ultimate source of hope God loves you we love you we want God's best for you please uh, if there's anything we can do could you hand me that paper if there's anything we can do to pray for you we want to do that and uh, we have quite a few people that we prayed for last Thursday in our, our, our uh, prayer and share time and we will lift you up before God Almighty and ask for him to work on your behalf and we consider all of our seafarers part of our, our family and so if you don't communicate with us your needs then we can't really be a close family member and so please let us know if if you're somebody who's like you know I I really like the idea of having a relationship with God 
I really think that's a, a, an awesome thing that you're talking about, but I can't relate. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know that you're a sinner? The Bible is so clear that each of us has, has sinned. Each of us has missed the mark. And that's why God had to make a way through sending his son Jesus to live a perfect life, to die uh, a terrible death on a cross that would pay the sacrifice for your sin and my sin. And then they put him in a grave, but he didn't stay there. He conquered death for you and for me. And that same resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave is what transforms our hearts, our minds, to be more like Christ, that brings us spiritual life. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that um, you must be born again if you want to inherit the kingdom of God. And so uh, the way that you become born again is by trusting in Jesus Christ to be your way of salvation. Nothing else. We repent of everything in our life, whether we have uh, sin that is something that was done in the past or something that we're practicing today. We say, Lord, I repent of trying to earn my own way to heaven. I repent in of having called on other gods. I repent on... on uh, on all the things that I've done, and I trust only in Jesus Christ, and I want to serve him, I want to follow him from this day forward. And so that's what it takes to become a follower of Jesus. It's not about religion, right? It's not about religion, I promise. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that you can have. Start today. Begin reading his word. We've been going through his word, but if if you're a new follower and you just want to fall in love with Jesus, read the book of John. And before you start reading, say, God, I want to understand what I'm reading. Can you help me to understand and apply it? And that is a prayer that God will answer. Please let us know uh, how you're doing spiritually, physically, emotionally, and we will be happy to pray for you and your family. God bless you, and uh, and we'll see you tomorrow, and uh, Steve will be bringing the message tomorrow. God bless.